Today we will continue our discussion on different patterns of organization and we will look at two important patterns definition and illustration. So, let us start with definition. So, what is a definition and why do we define something and where do we use this technique. So, if you usually look at where we use definitions, we use these definitions regarding a technical term. I have an example here. So, if you look at preamble of Indian constitution, you find these words they are used to describe our uh, country, sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic, republic. So, each of these terms here is technical and you may want to define these uh, terms. So, for example, sovereign here it means it is not under the control of somebody else, it is not even a commonwealth country and so on. So, these technical terms we define. Sometimes you may want to explain an unfamiliar word as well. Uh, let us look at this example. By saying John and Mary together again after their bitter fight, I was befuddled. So, you have used the word befuddled here and uh, your audience, the person who you are talking to does not know the meaning of this. Then you might want to explain what this term means. So, when we define a term, what do we do? So, we identify features that distinguish it from other terms. So, what are the you know specific characteristics, uh, traits which make this particular term unique, you know make it uh, separate from other things then establish its boundaries and by using it so, we separate it from closely related synonyms. So, we will look at uh, an example. Uh, say for example, you are uh, defining between autocracy and dictatorship. So, there may be some similarities, but they are different. So, you want to define each term so that the distinguishing features become very prominent. So, experts usually identify three kinds of definitions. They are listed here. One is synonyms or sometimes translational equivalents, then essential definition and extended definition. Let us look at each one of these in detail. First one is synonyms. So, you have used say an unfamiliar word or you come across something while you are reading. One way in fact, the easiest way is to define that term using a synonym. This can help avoid lengthy cumbersome explanations, saves time. Say for example, we saw in the earlier example, the word was befuddled. So, you can define it using synonyms like confused, puzzled. You can also give translational equivalent. Uh, say you are explaining something to somebody and uh, they do not understand the meaning of that word in English. So, you can give its translational equivalent in the mother tongue. So, that is one way of defining a term. However, we are more interested in the other two kinds namely essential definition and extended definition. So, what are these? Let us look at what essential definitions are. So, I have some examples here. So, you have a term and it has been defined. A howdah is a covered seat for riding on the back of an elephant or a camel. Another example, to parboil is to boil meat, vegetables or fruits until they are partially cooked. 
So, you can see here that an essential definition has three main parts. First one is the term you are defining, second you put it under the broad category and then you also include distinguishing features. Say first example, how down? So, this is the term. So, what broad category it comes under? It is a kind of covered seat. So, if you just say that is not enough, you have to say how this is different from other members of this category. So, the distinguishing features are here for riding on the back of an elephant or a camel. So, this is a noun, you can also define a verb that has been done here. So, superb so oil, you know, you can put under the broad category of boiling meat, vegetables or fruits, but there are different kinds of boiling. So, how is this different? So, you are adding, uh, you know, distinguishing features here. So, this is one kind of boiling, you know, where um, you cook until the ingredients are only partially cooked. So, you have three um, parts in a, an essential definition. Say, um, you are going to define uh, vacuum cleaner. So, how are you going to define it? So, first thing is you need to identify the broad category it comes under. So, this you can put under the category of a household appliance. This category actually, you know, uh, contrasts with other categories such as electrical appliance, electronic gadget, a piece of furniture. So, all these, you know, let us say within the household context. So, for example, you are uh, defining a television, then electrical appliance may be more appropriate. Say, you are uh, talking about mobile phone, it is an electronic gadget. Um, say, you are um, talking about say uh, divan. So, what is it? So, then you would need this category. So, first identify the broad category and then what are its sp special features. So, now we are going to define it based on um, how it uh, works and what function it performs. So, vacuum cleaner, it uses suction to clean. So, uh, where we use it mainly carpet, sofa set, interiors of a car, uh, you know this kind of thing. Um, then there are some other features also. So, uh, vacuum cleaner may be wet or dry, it may sometimes include a blower as well. But since these two are you know kind of uh, additional details, you can define a vacuum cleaner mainly on the basis of point number 1 and 2. So, you can say that a vacuum cleaner is a household appliance which uses suction to clean mainly carpet, sofa set or interiors of a car. So, that is a kind of you know uh, definition you have come up with for vacuum cleaner. However, there are many flaws there may be several limitations sometimes regarding these essential definitions. So, what are these? So, let us look at um, these examples. One problem could be your definition may become circular. Instead of defining the term, you are actually reiterating the same thing again and again. So, you are not helping your readers understand that particular thing. So, this is called a circular definition. So, let us look at an example. A psychiatrist is a physician who practices psychiatry. So, here you are trying to define the term psychiatrist, but what have you done here? You have made it a circular definition because you are saying is a physician, okay, this is the broad category, that is fine. But who practices psychiatry? So, then the question remains, so what is psychiatry? 
this is a, you know, a kind of circular thing, you have reiterated the same thing and therefore, the term here remains unexplained. Second problem could be, you might end up with a definition which is overly broad. So, therefore, it does not help in distinguishing that particular feature. So, recall here that when you define something, you set up boundaries and you distinguish this particular thing from its closely related concepts or items or objects. So, if you are not able to distinguish it from other members of that same broad category, then the definition is not effective. So, let us look at an example here. So, if you say a platypus is a mammal, so you are here trying to define what a platypus is and you have simply said it is a mammal, but many other animals come under this broad category of mammal. So, how is a platypus a pus different from you know other members say a horse or even human beings. So, here you have left out uh, key features of a platypus say like, like you know it is an egg laying mammal. So, you have left out a uh, distinguishing feature of this um, animal. So, therefore, this definition is too broad and does not serve our purpose. Next is the opposite of it, you become so specific and as a result you may leave out some essential features. So, you zero in on only one of the features and define it in a very narrow sense. Hmm. Say for example, here is a definition, a kitchen blender is a bladed appliance used to chop vegetables. Yes, it is an appliance, right, it has blades, uh, here is a problem, we will see and you are saying it is used to chop vegetables. True, but this is only one of the uses of a kitchen blender. You can also use it to simply blend, say you are making lassi um, something, you can use it you can also use it to make buttermilk. So, there are many other uses of a kitchen blender. So, this is overly specific and as a result, it does not clearly explain all the features of the appliance that is a kitchen blender here. Then, another problem could be you leave out the main category. So, if you recall, here we noted that you need to place the given term under a specific broad category, but if you do not do it, then the definition is incomplete. Say, here is an example. So, say um, you do not know uh, the meaning of uh, dhaba, you are explaining it to your friend. Say, then you say a dhaba is where food is served. So, what is it? So, is it a kind of a eatery or is it a piece of furniture because food is served on table also, right. So, uh, the broad category here is um, missing. So, therefore, uh, this kind of definition is also uh, faulty and incomplete. We move to the third kind that is extended definition. So, we have seen that sometimes essential definitions you know may not serve a purpose. In such a case, you may need to write a paragraph or a, sometimes a complete paper explaining a term. So, usually the term is very complex or it has multi dimensions and so, you cannot define it in just one sentence. So, then you go for an extended definition. For example, if you have to define the term capitalism, there is no one definition possible because there are various you can say um, versions of capitalism 
and so a single line, a sen sentence may not capture all the characteristics. So, you need an extended definition for uh, this thing, this term. So, let us now look at an example. Jane and Smith were proud new parents of an 8 pound 10 ounce baby girl named Jenny. One summer night, Jane put Jenny to bed at 8 pm. When she went to check on her at 3 am, Jane found Jenny dead. The baby had given no cry of pain, shown no sign of trouble. Even the doctor did not know why she had died for she was healthy and strong. The autopsy report confirmed the doctor's suspicion. The infant was a victim of sudden infant death syndrome SIDS or crib death. SIDS is the sudden and unexplainable death of an apparently healthy sleeping infant. It is the number one cause of death in infants after the first week of life and as a result has been the subject matter of numerous research studies. So, as you can see here, the writer here is attempting to define this term sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS. But this is very difficult to explain. So, the writer here you know starts with you can say an illustration, a particular anecdote and using that the writer here defines what this is. So, this is in the context of an infant baby girl named Jenny what happened to her and then using that the writer then says see this is a case of SIDS. So, this is an example of uh, an extended definition. So, instead of simply saying SIDS uh, or you know sudden infant death syndrome is a disease where you know infants die without any um, uh, clear reason something like that. You here the writer has used an anecdote um, which clearly you know shows all the uh, features of this. So, there may not be any uh, clear reasons, no diseases, nothing, uh, the baby was just sleeping and the baby just died. So, all the things which are necessary to understand what this is are included here. So, this is one of the things um, when uh, we will look at when um, we discuss illustration. The example you choose must be adequate and must clearly explain the term you are planning to explain. Okay. Now, we will look at a long text. This text is about data preparation, it is written by Margaret Roos. So, what is it? So, let us read it. Data preparation is the process of gathering, combining, structuring and organizing data. So, it can be analyzed as part of data visualization, analytics and machine learning applications. The components of data preparation include pre-processing, profiling, cleansing, validation and transformation. It often also involves pulling together data from different internal systems and external sources. Data preparation work is done by information technology, IT and business intelligence BI teams as they integrate data sets to load into a data warehouse, a NoSQL database or Hadoop data lake repository. In addition, data analysts can use self-service data preparation tools to collect and prepare data for analysis when using data visualization tools such as Tableau. Purposes of data preparation. One of the primary purposes of data preparation 
is to ensure that information being readied for analysis is accurate and consistent. So, the results of BI and analytics applications will be valid. Data is often created with missing values, inaccuracies or other errors. Additionally, data sets stored in separate files or databases often have different formats that need to be reconciled. The process of correcting inaccuracies, performing verification and joining data sets constitutes a big part of the data preparation process. In big data applications, data preparation is largely an automated task since it could take years of work by IT staffers or data analysts to manually correct every field in every file that is due to be used in an analysis. Machine learning algorithms can, spend, can speed things up by examining data fields and automatically filling in blank values or renaming certain fields to ensure consistency when data files are being joined. Data preparation process. After data has been validated and reconciled, data preparation software runs files through a workflow during which specific operations are applied to files. For example, this step may involve creating a new field in the data file that aggregates counts from pre-existing fields or applying a statistical formula such as a linear or logistic regression model to the data. After going through the workflow, data is output into a finalized file that can be loaded into a database or other data store. where it is available to be analyzed. Even though data preparation methods have become highly automated, it can still take up significant amounts of time, especially as the volume of data used in analysis continues to grow. Data scientists often complain that they spend a majority of their time locating and cleansing data rather than actually analyzing it. Partly for that reason, there has been an increase in the number of software vendors attempting to tackle the data preparation problem and many organizations are putting more resources toward automating data preparation. In 2017, data visualization vendor Tableau added self-service data preparation as part of its software using machine learning methods to simplify the data preparation process. Benefits of data preparation. One of the biggest benefits of instituting a formal data preparation process is that users can spend less time finding and structuring their data. Many enterprises have implemented data lakes often built around Hadoop data stores where they store large amounts of semi-structured and unstructured data. When a data scientist needs a data set for an analysis, they have to hunt down the data first. With the formal data preparation process in place, repetitive analysis can be fed data automatically rather than requiring users to locate and cleanse the data each time. So, this is the source from where uh, this article has been taken. It has, it is an adapted version of the full article you find um, here. So, let us look at the uh, text. So, as is clear, this article is an extended definition of the term data preparation. So, if you look at the first paragraph, there is a, a clear definition of this term. So, what is data preparation? It is a process so, this is a kind of you know a broad category. So, it is not a product, it is a process. So, what specifically? Gathering, combining, structuring and organizing data. So, it can be analyzed as part of data visualization, analytics and machine learning application. So, what it is and uh, why it, this is important, why it is done. 
So, all the things are included here, but the term is here so uh, complex and the definition as you can see includes several again technical term. So, the rest of the text defines this in detail. If you look at the second paragraph, the components of data preparation include pre-processing, profiling, cleansing, validation and transformation. So, it breaks it into some components and then it uh, the next paragraph here you know talks about who actually deals with this. So, people um, you know uh, in information technology and business intelligence teams. So, they do it. Then you can see there is a subsection titled purposes of data preparation. So, why data is prepared? What is the need for doing this? So, it is here one of the primary purposes of data preparation is to ensure that information being ready for analysis is accurate and consistent. So, results will be valid. So, why this needs to be done that is explained here. Data is often created with missing values, there are inaccuracies, multiple files. So, you need to correct inaccuracies, perform verification and join different data sets. Then here it introduces this automated task and uh, uh, because uh, it takes lot of time to do it manually. So, machine learning algorithms can speed up things here. And then there is the next subsection data preparation process. The first one explained um, why data preparation needs to be done, what are uh, the primary purposes. Then this section explains how it is done. So, after data has been validated and reconciled, this is step 1, then data preparation software runs files through a workflow during which specific operations are applied. So, what are these? Then uh, the writer gives an example here, of, you know, some specific operations applied to files like you know applying a statistical formula and so on. And then um, this introduces something about uh, you know uh, software which uh, reduces the amount of time spent on it. Then the final section uh, gives details about benefits of data preparation. So, if you do it, so what happens? So, in this way here writer takes up the term uh, data preparation, defines it, but the process the term is so complex, it involves several stages. So, there is an extended definition, writer gives about purposes, then how it is done, then what are the benefits. So, um, all the information related to this particular technical term, data preparation is um, actually included in this extended definition. So, we move on. When you are planning to draft an extended definition, so what are the things you need to keep in mind? First, you pick an abstract or a technical term. So, this is very important. If you try to define something very simple or something which people you know have a clear understanding of, then it does not make any sense. So, for example, if you, you know say I am going to define the term uh, table as a piece of furniture, uh, it does not serve your purpose because people know what a table is and it is not fairly abstract or technical. So, the term you choose is either very technical means it is uh, specific to one particular field. So, as we saw data preparation you know it is related to information technology. So, that is a technical term. Sometimes it may be an abstract. So, autocracy for example. So, what is it? So, then you have a good chance of writing an extended definition in a, an effective manner. Second, what is the purpose of your write up? So, are you trying to uh, explain that term to your readers who do not know about it or you 
or you are just trying you know a uh, way of you know fun approach to something. So, what exactly is your purpose? Who is the audience? So, are you writing for people with specific technical knowledge or is it for general public? So, these things matter. For example, uh, here we saw this the language here is fairly simple and so you can say this is aimed at uh, general public, but the other text we looked at data preparation has many technical terms. So, some amount of knowledge of that particular field may be necessary. So, you modify your write up according to your target audience. And you can use some techniques to uh, write an extended definition. First one is uh, narration. So, you can trace the history of the origin and development of a particular term, say computer mouse. So, when was it first used, uh, in what sense and now uh, uh, where we use this term, because computer mouse also has evolved. So, how this term has been you know adapted, how it applies to different things. So, that is what you will do here. Second is description, you give details of important features of a person, place, object, an event, a phenomena. For example, ice age. So, if you are defining ice age, so then you explain you know the polar ice extends, you know how the climate would be. So, all those things you will include. Process. So, here you explain what a device does, how some how something happens. For example, tsunami. So, it will say that tsunami is a gigantic sea wave usually caused by earthquakes. So, and then you explain how an earthquake uh, can trigger a giant tsunami, how a tsunami wave travels in deep ocean. So, what happens when the wave reaches the shore? So, these details you include. Next is illustration. So, you define an abstract term using concrete examples. See, uh, you are defining this term learner centered pedagogy. So, what does it mean? You take an example. So, you say how teacher in a specific class is teaching and um, say how the teacher is giving lot of opportunities for learners to express themselves, um, then uh, about seating arrangement. So, all these aspects you know these are concrete uh, instances, you use them to define this technical term. Next classification, you make categories and define each one with example, say you are defining comedy. So, what is a comedy? So, you you have dark comedy, you have what we call you know very uh, co comedy based on body language. So, all these uh, different sub genres you can um, explain and give an example. Comparison, you define a new term with the help of a more familiar one. For example, um, ransomware. So, uh, this is you know uh, uh, somebody uh, hacks your computer and demands money uh, if you want again control of your computer. Uh, so, this is something similar to kidnapping a person asking for money. So, you can uh, use a comparison. Cause effect, you explain origins of a phenomena, its causes, sometimes symptoms, characteristics and so on. For example, Alzheimer's disease. So, what is it? What are the symptoms? What are the possible causes? What are possible effects? So, you use this kind of pattern. You can also use something called what we say negation. So, you define a term by saying what it does not mean, what it does not include. For example, you say that 
you define the term freedom by very clearly saying it does not include absolute freedom, freedom to do anything one wishes to do. So, by saying freedom does not mean this, you are employing this uh, strategy of negation. Now, you can choose one of these topics and attempt an extended definition. Topics are depression. So, what is it? Um, so, you give details about it, family values, um, online course. So, in all these first you give a simple definition, then you give more details following one of these you know uh, techniques listed here like narration, description, process, illustration, classification, comparison, cause effect, negation these things. We will now look at another pattern of organization that is illustration. Let us look at this example. Predicting the weather is far from an exact science. Two winters ago, a surprise snowstorm hit. So, if you look at this extract, the writer here first makes a statement predicting the weather is far from an exact science. Then, there is some reference to a winter storm in order to elaborate the first statement. So, writer is here using a specific instance, an example to give more details about this statement. So, this is you know what we call the technique of illustration. So, we use examples to make a general thing um, clear or the thing which you are trying to explain may be abstract. So, you need examples to make it clear. So, you may have heard this saying a picture is worth a thousand words. So, this you know shows the importance of examples, particularly if it is abstract, no matter you know how lengthy your explanation is, it may not be very effective unless you give some concrete example. So, one example you know makes things very clear. So, when you are um, defining a general term or when you are defining an abstract term or abstract process, abstract concept, if you use adequate examples, your writing becomes very effective. So, we will look at more about these examples. So, how you can choose examples, how you can use them in your writing. So, first important task is selecting appropriate examples. So, you have a concept to define. So, now you need examples. So, so, what is a good example? So, one is the example or the examples you choose should support your main thesis, should be directly related to what you are talking about and it means no digressions at all. So, it should be directly related to what you are trying to explain. Second thing is the example should be able to you know explain all at least all the major features of the concept you are trying to explain. If it is only a partial you know coverage then it is again a problem. You may need more examples. Um, so, two important criteria. One examples you choose should be directly related to your thesis. Second, it should be a clear case, clear instantiation of that particular concept. We will look at examples, then you know this point becomes clear. So, this is an extract from a student essay. The student here is trying to uh, you know uh, explain the concept of depression. So, this is a fairly uh, you know uh, complex and 
um, it is rather uh, very difficult to explain it. So, uh, there are many misconceptions among people. So, here uh, the writer uses an example. So, let us look at it. Carl was not just sad, nothing really bad had happened in his life, but he had lost all his interest in his past favorite activities. His skateboard had been discarded in a corner of his room. He no longer bothered to play his video games. Simple things such as getting a ticket for a rock concert seemed to be too much effort for him. Some days he stayed in bed and missed his classes. Without a doubt, Carl was depressed. This short example meets many key characteristics of depression. A lack of interest in normal activities, a sense that ordinary things are not worth the effort, inability to attend to ordinary responsibilities, irritability. irritability. So, here as you can see, the student is trying to define the term depression and uh, some characteristics of this include a lack of interest in normal activities, you know a feeling that things are are not worth the effort, you are unable to attend to your responsibilities of everyday life, you get irritated very easily. Um, so, all these things seem quite abstract. So, unless you have a clear example, so this does not become clear. So, for example, what is an ordinary responsibility? What do I mean by this? So, what do I mean by you know get irritated? So, when should one get irritated, when one should not? So, these are slightly abstract things. So, here with an example, these things become clear. So, if you look at this example of a student, so there are clear um, in, uh, you know explanations. So, he had lost interest in his favorite activities like you know skateboard, uh, then video games, he was no longer interested in them, then uh, he was not putting in efforts for even simple things like buying a ticket for a concert or regular responsibility like attending classes. So, all these things clearly uh, explain what uh, these um, abstract words mean. So, writer has very carefully used an example to explain this abstract term in a very effective manner. So, that is the power of examples. Now, let us look at um, longish text. As you can see, this text is called why taking risks comes with great rewards. It is written by Statue of Peers. Let us look at the text. If you ever want to achieve the life you always dreamt of, you will have to start taking positive calculated risks. It is absolutely necessary to take chances to achieve anything great in life. However, many are scared to take the initial leap. As with any risk, there is always something at stake. In most instances, when it comes to your business, you stand to lose money, time and your reputation, which are also the very same things you stand to gain. The benefits of taking risks will enrich your life and make your business or career much more rewarding. One of my clients worked for the government for 15 years before deciding to start his own business. I helped him pinpoint his true passions and create a plan to profit from them. After moving to a new state, Instead of searching for another civil servant position, he took his skills and experience of being an urban planner and translated them into a viable business for himself. Nervous about launching out on his own, 
he expressed this was the biggest risk he had ever taken and worried about where the income and clients would come from. However, after being in business for one year, he has already landed multiple contracts and generated a six figure income. After taking the risk of quitting his job and launching his own firm, he is much happier and experiencing life on a new level. The benefits of taking risks. Taking risks opens you up to new challenges and opportunities. Push yourself to learn a new skill such as public speaking which comes in handy as a business owner. Two, taking risks empowers you to establish new limits in your mind. We all have boundaries or a comfort zone where we would like to stay and many have misconstrued visions of what we think we deserve or are capable of accomplishing. When you take risks, you can eradicate that thinking, establish new boundaries, improve your outlook on life and your ability to achieve on high levels. Point number three, taking risks can cause you to become more creative. When you put yourself out on a limb with a no excuse approach, your natural problem solving skills kick in and you are open to new ideas and are willing to try something new. Fourth, taking risks can result in a positive outcome. Not every life step can be carefully planned out. You will never know if you can succeed unless you venture out into new territory. Is there a risk involved to do something totally new? Sure, but the reward is there too. When you give it your best shot and put all that you can into achieving the goal, you are more likely to make it happen. Taking risks help you to clearly define what you really want. Calculated risks are taken with careful thought, yet the fact that you are taking a risk pushes you to make things work. Surely, you will first have to determine if the reward is something you really want enough to take the chance. If it is, then move ahead and do not look back. Point number six, once you have become accustomed to taking risks, you break free from the average way of living and thinking. Instead of fighting to stay safe, you gain the momentum and confidence needed to welcome new opportunities in your career or business. Risks build your self-confidence and self-respect, empowering you to feel stronger and more confident in taking on new endeavors. When you are open to new challenges, you position yourself to profit a whole lot more than you would just staying the same. The final paragraph, taking chances requires some blind trust in most cases. Nothing is really guaranteed. However, you have to trust your instincts. Sometimes your gut is leading you down an unknown path, but inside you know that something big is on the other side. Go for it. You will never know what all you can accomplish until you do something you have never done. Take the risk, you will step into some of your biggest rewards. So, this is from HuffingtonPost.com. So, as you can see, here the writer is um, actually urging people to take risks. So, she defines actually kind of you know what risk taking is and when you need to do, what are the problems and then um, she says there are several benefits and therefore, um, you need to uh, take risk. Uh, an important aspect is right uh, here in this part gives details about a person. So, this you know is using illustration to make your point. So, writer here is as I mentioned urging people to take risks because she argues there is reward in it. So, how it has happened in real life uh, with the actual person. So, those details are 
here. So, this is about she, uh, one of her clients. This person has worked for the government for 15 years, then he has quit it and has um, started to um, work on his own, started a, his own business, he moved to a new place. So, if you can see here, uh, this person was nervous about launching a business on his own. He was worried if he would get clients and whether he would you know get sufficient income. Um, but uh, after a bit of coaxing and bit of kind of you know uh, guidance, the person has launched it and now the writer says, after being in business for one year, uh, he has already landed multiple contracts and generated a six figure income. So, it means, so the risk taking has you know, given this person rewards. So, after taking the risk of quitting his job and launching his own firm, he is much happier and experiencing life on a new level. So, this clearly says, uh, though uh, the person was hesitant initially, um, finally he uh, took a big risk, he quit his government job. So, stable income, all the advantages, he uh, quit it, started his own business, many people might laugh at it, but this person has been now uh, successful, he is very happy as well. So, this instance here, this illustration makes the case very strong. So, writer here you know says like this person you can also become successful if you take calculated risk. So, that is the main argument here and this illustration actually uh, makes it very strong. So, this is how you use good examples to build your point. So, um, now you can choose one of these topics and attempt um, to uh, you know uh, choose an appropriate example. So, first one is not all education goes on in the classroom. So, what do you think would be an appropriate example? You can take it from your own life or from people you know. So, you can say that we learn many things from our friends, you know, uh, by interacting with uh, others, um, the outside world. Then you give a, a clear example. Say you learned how to deal with uh, people. Uh, say you were, uh, you know, you visited um, Temple Town. You have to deal with people there. You didn't know the local language somehow you manage. So, that gave you confidence. So, that is how you know that example can actually um, strengthen this point. Sometimes a minor incident drastically changes a person's life. So, here again this is an abstract statement. So, uh, what is a minor incident? What is drastically changing? So, these things you know you need to make it clear with the help of examples something like you know your friend um, helping you uh, financially when you were really in a bad shape. Uh, so, that minor incident made you rethink about value of friendship say. So, so you need to choose an uh, example which appropriately um, helps your readers understand uh, what a minor incident is and how drastically it has changed your life. So, this again could be from your life or could be from others life um, as well. For example, uh, Mahatma Gandhi when he was very young, he once attempted to uh, steal something, then um, he felt guilty, he wrote to his father about it, his father was upset, but finally father you know forgave him and that changed. Um, uh, young uh, Gandhi's um, attitude and uh, you know outlook. So, how a minor incident can drastically change a person's life. So, choosing an appropriate example is very important. So, when you are planning and drafting, so this is a kind of general structure you can um, use, you know. 
supporting detail 1, 2 and so on you include under example 1. Similarly, under example 2, under example 3. So, in the text we saw about you know taking risk, the writer uses only one example. Sometimes you may uh, want to use more than one example. Um, so, um, in that case, um, you will, will have this kind of organization. So, first you state your point, then you use uh, multiple examples. So, paragraph 1 will include information about example 1 under that the details then example 2 example 3 and so on thank you